Um, next uh, contributor, Warren Overton. Now, Warren's career started, you will have noticed, and if, if there's a word, I think, to uh, underscore the theme of what we're about this evening, uh, one of the words, at least, would be diversity, and it's in the careers of these various uh, contributors this evening as much as anything else. War Warren's career started in hydrogeology and landform evolution and studying how the climate shapes our landscapes. After moving to Canberra, and I'm not sure if that's why or whether Canberra did it to him or what, Warren worked for several years as a technical manager in the Greenhouse Challenge Office and played a key role in the, in the development of the Cities for Climate Protection program. He was a manager of the ANU's Energy and Sustainability Office for three years where he wrote the ESD, uh, Ecologically Sustainable Development, building standards for the university. He later established the ACT Office of Energetics, delivering energy audits, technical support for government programs, and assisting clients' implementation of environmental management systems, no less. Warren is currently managing director of Viridis E3, a multidisciplinary consultancy he formed in 2007, which has rapidly grown to 20 staff and built the reputation of one of Australia's leading green building consulting firms assisting companies with the achievement of Green Star and Neighbours ratings, which I'm, I'm sure you will have heard of, and providing training and support to clients on how to deliver green projects. It now is also working on master planning projects and with, with companies striving to integrate sustainability into their operations, which is an essential part of moving towards a sustainable society. Warren's also been active in several community organisations and formed the ACT chapter of Urban Ecology Australia back in 1996. Um, some of these things have been around for a long time, haven't we? Mm. Um, th this incident is uh, some of the weirdest people on top of a building in Brisbane. Perhaps Warren would like to explain what they're doing there and, and what those things are. Ha having a holiday. Uh, that's actually uh, Santos Place, a, a 30 odd story. Um, uh, office tower in Brisbane that got a, a six star green star rating but that's actually the uh, the solar thermal array on the roof of the building which provides something in the order of about 80 percent of the the hot water in the commercial building so that's just having a bit of a clue what um, what I wanted to talk about tonight was um, Marcy and um, Janice have already covered about a lot of the technical opportunities we have ahead of us as well as some of the community stuff too and um, over the last three years in our company and, and even before that and in the same vein as what Marcy was saying, having worked on a lot of individual building projects and seen the technologies and the things you can do to improve your building, the key message that's really coming out of it for me is the, um, is the human side of it. And um, it comes back to this question about what buildings are for. Really the most sustainable building is probably the one we don't build um, in the first place. And even thinking about our need for buildings and what really is that need, obviously shelter, the first rudimentary forms of construction we ever did was to protect us from the elements. In doing shelter as well, and the communities that evolved, it was a cooperative exercise. And as we started to cooperate, we can actually start building more and more complex uh, structures to support ourselves as well. This was all about supporting our well-being, our, our building skills, our complexity of our building. And then unfortunately, the damage we then inherently did to the environment with that also came with this greater level of cooperation that we had and it was striving to achieve a, an amount of well-being as well. If we got to that point of evolution where our societies were so advanced, the, the icing on the cake of our buildings is the culture and art side of it. Um, this is where I'll, I'll, I'll slightly disagree with Marcy. I do hope that the buildings that we design can influence people and in many ways as well as influencing people, they are a reflection of who we are. Um, as an individual here tonight, your single largest investment ever in your life is probably the purchase of your home or multiple homes as you move along. So really, it's a pretty serious decision you should make about this house that you buy. What does it mean for you as an individual? What does it mean to your community? What is it giving to the community? What is it giving to you as well? What does it mean to you as a, as a human being? And we're probably becoming a little bit divorced from that because as I said down the bottom, buildings and cities, they're, they're not consumer items. They're sold as consumer items, very much so. So yes, you can have your three car garage with attached McMansion. Um, if you look at 
the size of, I'm being moved on, if you look at the size of our buildings, I didn't wave. If we look at the size of our buildings since the 1950s, the size of our buildings has increased enormously, something in the order of two to three hundred percent. Yes, I know that you know, obesity is a bit of an issue, but we are not two to three hundred percent larger than what we were in the 1950s. The amount of square meterage we take up is enormous. So, you know, we've got an appetite for these luxuries, and so these things are growing. Now, no? Now. <laughs> so, we need to address that sort of mindset. Um, and yes, we do have the technology. We had it in the 1970s when Steve Austin ran around and did his things. Um, we had it in the 1870s. We had it in the 0070s. The design technologies, the design principles have been around for forever, well, forever really, because they're natural principles. Um, Pliny the Elder, a Roman philosopher, wrote about passive design hundreds, many, many hundreds of years ago. Paul was saying that in 600... Century. In the 6th century, there were laws about solar access, which we're now struggling to get back into our cities now. So none of this is new. The technologies are there. The best we're doing at the moment is maybe tinkering with some of the renewable energy technologies, which is great. That's going to help us a lot. But the fundamental design principles, the energy efficiency, the water savings, all of that, it's been there. We've just got to choose to use it and adapt to it and use it in our buildings. What we don't have at the moment is the willpower, and I chose that picture of a, a barn raising because to me that epitomises really what buildings should be. They're currently a consumer item. You go and get a glossy brochure, you flick through it. This is this is a new house, okay? When you buy an existing house, well, it's still a glossy brochure. You get this glossy brochure and you flick through it and you think about what colour tiles do I want in the kitchen and do I want a granite bench top or not? You don't get a hell of a lot more choice than that unless you employ one of these highly talented architects or other people out there. But nearly everybody in the market is buying a project home, sausage machines, fit them out, and there's not a lot of choice. You get what they are offering you. You'd like to think that as a consumer you've got a bit of power, but a lot of it's actually been force-fed to you about what your choices are. What we really need to do is start standing up and thinking about what our choices are, what we really want in our houses. Um, if you look at the options you're getting, you only are getting the McMansion feast. Um, there's uh, some very talented designers who are designing small, compact, comfortable houses that are, um, if you've been to Christie Walk, any of you there, you can see the quality of life you can achieve in a very small space. And I see Joan at the back there and you put your hand up and say, it's a fantastic place to live. So you don't have to have these enormous houses. Um, the, the term that I see bandied around at the moment is eco-bling. Um, People who are wanting to uh, wear their green heart on their sleeve and show that they're doing the right thing. Yes, you can sprinkle photovoltaics on the roof. Yes, you can buy a Prius car. But really, is it a good social model if only the rich can have their 500 square metre eco mansions with their Tesla electric vehicle in the garage while the rest of the public can't afford to actually have a sustainable house? So we need to start bringing sustainability back down to the basics where the average person the less than average person can actually achieve sustainability in their house. So it's a design paradigm we need to change. What? That, that's my little social rant. So I'm interested in the social side of it. I don't think the technology is really a problem for us. What I, the positive thing I do want to talk about is um, I work a lot on, on rating systems for buildings and quite often, and as Janice said, the rating systems are sort of looking at the do less bad. You know, a six star rated building supposedly world's best practice, is still a drain on the environment. It's so far from where we really need to be. The great news is there's a, a new program out, I'm only going to dwell on it quickly, called Living Building Challenge. It's come out of the US, so I'm actually trying to introduce it in here in Australia. Um, the idea behind it, it's really drawing upon nature. It's talking about um, buildings that are sensitive to their local environment. Yes, they harvest their energy and water and they're adapted to the site. They don't produce pollutants into the environment. But the really encouraging thing about this, if we go to the next slide, is that we continually forget about our buildings and for sustainability we continually focus on energy and water and those sorts of things. And if you look at the circle yellow bit down the bottom, these guys are now starting to say, well, sustainability also includes equity. It also includes beauty. It also includes the, the social value that these buildings, these houses, these offices or whatever actually create for our community. Um, so my little crusade at the moment is to get people to think about 
when they want to build a building, truly what it is they're trying to achieve out of it. What does it mean to them as an individual? What does it mean to them as a business? Does it reflect who, who you are? Does it, does it grow you as an individual or an organisation? And does it actually contribute to the sustainability of your local community as well? I think that's my last slide. Thank you very much.